it is. Well, hello, folks. We apologize for our technical delay there. Um, here we are at the historic Winover Airfield for our first live history lesson. Apologies for the delay. And we were going to attempt to do a live YouTube stream as well, but we apologize. We're just working with Facebook Live at the moment. Hopefully this will be okay and is streaming okay. If people are having difficulty seeing things, let us know. Um, but I'm Landon Wilkie here at the Historic Wendover Airfield. I'm the museum curator. And I just wanted to talk to you today about um, some of the history of the base and Wendover, and then also our topic of the day, which we will get to. So, <clears throat> for those who aren't too familiar with Wendover, Wendover is right on I-80 um, on the Utah-Nevada border. Even today we're about 125 miles in any direction from the nearest civilization. So it's still pretty remote. So just imagine how it was back in the day when there were just two-lane highways or possibly even less to get through this area. Um, and in, Wendover was founded in 1908 as a station for the Western Pacific Railroad where their locomotives could take on water to get through the mountains into Nevada or across the salt flats to the east of here into Utah. Um, something else notable about Wendover is the Bonneville Speedway and the Bonneville Salt Flats. We have a remarkable history there as far as setting land speed records just because of our unique um, geography. It's a great place for people to reach high speeds. So that's why we actually... So here's a picture just to kind of illustrate that. If you've ever heard of the movie World's Fastest Indian, this is Burt Monroe in the Monroe Special as he's getting started on his way down the salt flats. So the, a lot has actually happened out in Wendover, though people aren't aware of it. And as we talk about Wendover Air Base, you'll realize that's even more the truth. So while we're at it, I'll just let you know, as we get talking about these topics, if you have any questions specifically about those, feel free to type them in. And Jim, our director, director cameraman, and lighting specialist, will um, try to give those to me, and we'll see what we can give you. He might have to help me. And at the end of this video, we will also do a short question and answer session. So just keep those thoughts in mind. And as we go out, think of other topics about um, the Army Air Force in World War II or Wendover that you think might make an interesting topic for future lessons and let us know. So getting to Wendover Air Base, what happened is in the late 1930s, the government realized something was going on in Europe once again and just in case we were going to get pulled into that conflict, as we were in World War I, maybe we should start preparing and building up our military forces. So out here, what they were trying to do was construct a very large bombing and gunnery range at three and a half million acres that stretches from here in Wendover, back east towards the Great Salt Lake and throughout that swath of desert and the mountains there. And a lot of that is actually still in use today as the Utah Test and Training Range. But Wendover was built as an auxiliary base um, to Fort Douglas. We were a subpost, and in September of 1940 is when this base and some of the runways actually began construction. But Wendover being such a great place geographically, we have about 320 blue sky days a year and these great flat expanses where these guys can practice flying. In March of 1942, this actually opened as an independent Army Air Base. And from that point on, we trained 20 heavy bomb groups flying B-17s and B-24s over the course of the war. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that today. And then after the war, or later in the war, we trained a P-47 um, fighter wing. And then at the end, we trained these guys called the 509th Composite Group. So these are the ones who were actually dropping the atomic weapons on Japan. And this is where they came to train to figure out how to actually accomplish that task and what maneuvers they would need. And in addition to them, who had the Enola Gay, the boxcar, and their other modified B-29s here at Wendover with them before they shipped out to the Pacific, we also had the 216th Army Air Force Base Unit. Now, they were part of um, the Manhattan Project, and they were involved in 
assembling inert and high explosive versions of the, the little boy and fat man bombs. So you can see here in this picture, they're actually lowering one of these um, little boy prototypes into our atomic bomb loading pit, which is one of the few left in the world. So if you're able to come to Windover, stop and see that for sure. So Windover really was essential in making sure that those weapons would come out and help end the war as they were expected to, in addition to our heavy bomber training of thousands of air crews. So now to get to today's topic, which is flying clothing. And when I decided this topic, I was not expecting there would be too many people watching, but my cohorts have done a bit better job publicizing this than I expected, but hopefully it's still a little bit interesting to you. Um, but I just want to first start off by discussing airlines a little bit, just to help you make connections. So today, all over social media and the news, you'll see the airlines are just the worst. The cost of tickets are going up, the cost of baggage, um, these people on your sides are getting closer, as well as these people on either side of you. As they try to cram more seats and more people on there to make a profit, you never hear a good thing about airline food. But thinking about, <coughs> you know, what these people are actually doing on the airlines, I mean, you might have to put up with someone pushing your seat that's reclined maybe two inches, because that's all they go, I know. But for a comparison, we're going to talk about the bomber crews in World War II, particularly of heavy bombers, which were flying the B-17, um, which was built by Boeing, and the B-24 Liberator. So we'll have a couple of pictures of those for you. So here's the B-17 and the B-24. Now something to note, now these are a lot smaller than you think if you haven't seen one in person. In pictures, these look massive, especially if they're carrying you know, how many thousands of pounds of bombs. But in reality, even today's fighter jets rival these in size and can certainly outmax most of them in payload. So it was a whole different world and a whole different set of technology. So these guys are on typically eight hour missions flying into the heart of Germany or other locations around the world. And they're typically operating at about 20 to 25,000 feet. So. Something unique about operating at those altitudes is where the atmosphere is so thin, this goes back to our social media post on Tuesday, which was a teaser with an oxygen tank. Now, these guys had to be connected to oxygen at that, those altitudes, or within three or four minutes, they could easily become anoxic, which is deprived of oxygen in your brain or body, and they could easily die. Um, so that happened a lot for these air crews, whether their oxygen masks were um, um, shot up, or oftentimes they would freeze at that altitude, which is what we're getting at. So the other thing about these altitudes, we'll show you this graph. So these guys are operating at about um, 25. Where are we? <laughs> it's on the left side. There we are. <clears throat> so they're typically operating at 20 to 25,000 feet. So that actually puts them about um, over here at four miles above the earth and you can see that that results in a temperature of about negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit or Celsius. Not to mention some of these guys are actually standing by open windows flying at you know 200 miles an hour with all that extra wind chill to play a factor. So that's why we're talking about flying clothing because it was vital life support to get these guys through their missions so that they could drop the bombs and hopefully help bring the war to a quicker end. So the picture we shared was, these are actually four of our air crews who trained here at Wendover, walking down the flight line to their B-24 bomber. But you can see they're all equipped with different layers of clothing. These ones have bigger um, leather jackets that they're wearing. This guy has more of an A2 style. Then they also have their parachutes and all this other gear that they need, such as their helmets, to fly a successful mission. So our first bomb group that trained here was the 306th. I know we might have some people from the 306th watching, so I'll give you a shout out. But just to give you a little blip about that, they had a flight surgeon named Thurman Schuler, who was actually here in Wendover with them, and then deployed over to Europe as they began their combat duties. But he reported that um, 
for the most part, battle casualties weren't as big a concern because oftentimes they weren't the ones making it back to base. They were so shot up their planes were crashing over Germany or on their way home. But he said frostbite was a real problem to us. We didn't know really how to treat frostbite. And the biggest problem was that we really didn't have good heated clothing at the beginning of the war. And what we did have, our people didn't know how to use too well. So that's a big issue, especially if you're the flight surgeon having to figure out how to treat all these guys that are coming back with frostbite. So now we're going to talk a little bit about how this clothing came to be. So I'm going to put on some gloves so we can properly handle our artifacts. But we're going to look at our B3 ja winter jacket and our A3 winter trousers. These are what you'll typically see in photos of air crews um, when you look them up online or in books, because these were used throughout the entire war. So this one, if I can get back into the case. So this is the typical jacket. It's made of what's called sheep shearling. So it's actually sheep skin with the wool still attached. And sheep wool has terrific insulating properties, which is why they realized this was great for these guys flying at negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit at these altitudes. Now, the major issue was, at the beginning of the war, the U.S. Army, Air Force, and the Navy expected to need about 118 million square feet of sheep shearling to properly equip their air crews throughout the war. Now, if I've done my math right from figures I've found, that could be upwards of 17 million sheep that they would need to produce clothing for these guys to get through the end of the war successfully and hopefully alive. So you can see there might be a shortage coming if that's the case. But for the majority of the war, the guys were wearing typical suits like this. So you'll see these all have open pockets, really big, easy to get into, really big, heavy jackets. They have a collar for lining, so you can flip that up over your neck for a little extra protection. So at that point, you might actually be wearing a face mask or something else to really keep you covered. And then here's the trousers that would have went with this flight suit. So there you can see the shearling on the inside again. And then this also just has open pockets on the end of either pant leg. So the reason that these had to have these big pockets <coughs> is because at the time they were also wearing sheep shearling or pony hide gloves or rather mittens. But you can see these aren't your typical mitten because in addition to the articulating or separate thumb they have an articulating trigger finger so that they can still operate their 50 caliber machine guns and defend the aircraft as they approach their targets. So all sorts of adapt adaptations they had to make for these air crews. Another thing that we have that would have went with this suit is the A6 winter flying boot. So they were typically issued in this larger size. These would help keep their feet warm and insulate them. They could fit either a electric, um, a, an electrically heated insole or they could actually wear some of their service shoes underneath as well. Because if you have to bail out of the aircraft, these are not a good thing to have to be running in. They are too big and heavy and they're gonna be a pretty good giveaway of where you are as well. And one of the early problems is these actually would fly off of air crew as they bailed out because they were typically fitted so large. So the A6A um, flight boot just had extra straps to help keep it attached to their feet when they did have to exit the aircraft. But you can see even their boots are made out of leather and then they just have that rubber sole for some um, water protection when they get on the ground. So let's see. So then, another very popular jacket, we can actually have our cameraman pan around to our A2 jacket there. This was worn by Ralph Bellinger, who was on the atomic mission. But this is the typical style that you'll see um, fighter crews and even bomber crews wearing. They'll usually have their um, squadron insignia there, and especially the bomber crews, they liked to paint up the back of their jackets and have their nose art, their aircraft, and even their missions flown. So that's a good example. And since everyone loved those so much, those had been around since the early to mid 1930s. 
and they were really a status of yourself as a pilot or an air crew member. So everyone was a little surprised when in March of 1942, General Hap Arnold, who was the commander of the Army Air Forces, he organized a conference to showcase um, and display the flight clothing that the Army Air Force was currently using. So at this conference in Washington, Hap Arnold had laid out along a big table all the different examples. And he said, as I go down this line, anything I throw on the floor, we're going to phase out of the Army Air Force so we can get something better for our air crews. So as he goes down this line, one of the things he picks out is the A2 jacket, much to the chagrin of everyone else. Though fortunately there was already a surplus enough, I think a lot of people who wanted them got them. But at that time, General Hap Arnold said, we don't need leather, we need something better. So that's going back to the leather shortage we mentioned. He foresaw this and said, we need things that are a lot lighter, a lot less cumbersome than these big leather suits are, and things that are really going to help our air crews in this terrible environment at these altitudes. So, <clears throat> so there you can see some more examples. These guys are all in their A2 jackets. They typically had a leather name tag there to really show off and let people know who they were. And at this time, even with the leather suits, they were using some electrically heated suits that could go underneath. So these guys had all sorts of layers to stay warm. They started with some long john underwear. They had their typical GI pants and shirt. They had an electric um, flight suit, which was heated and could be plugged into the aircraft. Though early on, those were unreliable and they could easily short out and burn um, crew members. So those weren't favorable at the time, but they needed to use them. And then they would have their heavy jackets on top. But the adaptation that came after that <coughs> was urgent research into different textiles. That's what Hap Arnold helped urge along so his air crews could have better outfits. So this is called an intermediate flying suit. This is a B-15A jacket and A-11A trousers. So you might actually recognize this kind of style of jacket. But here, this is just kind of the second version. They came out with the B-10 and the B-15, which was the exact same as this, except then they added these little leather tabs where they could attach um, their oxygen mask so it could clip on and be out of their way. They had a couple little tabs where they could put wires such as for their headphones through so they weren't getting tangled. And one of the greatest innovations for aviators the world over was the extended pencil pockets. These are what you'll still see on flight suits all over as well as jackets being worn around the world today. So you don't realize how important things like that are. And going back to other life support issues, these pants, they actually could fit a bailout bottle, which was a small enough oxygen bottle that they could keep it in there, and then their oxygen hose would run up and actually go through these pockets here to stay in place. But if they had to bail out for any reason at altitude, they had enough oxygen to get to safe altitudes um, while breathing oxygen, and then they could get rid of it. So that helped ensure they weren't going to get anoxic as they were descending. So you can see there's still some animal um, byproducts in here, such as the leather tabs, and we still have some sheep wool or mouton um, collars there. But this made a big difference. This is actually a cotton twill shell, which is wind and water resistant. And overall, this is a lot lighter than our leather jackets. And on the interior of these, this is a 50-50 alpaca and wool pile fabric. So a pile fabric is a typical weave, just kind of that flat fabric, and then it has interwoven loops or different materials to help provide that insulation. So just like my two-year-old daughter loves her mink blankets of any sort that are lying around the house, it's because they have that pile fabric that's warm, comfortable, and insulating. So. I mean, they were really advancing a lot as far as the textiles that were available to um, make life function with an aircraft. So then let me scroll here. 
So in addition to the flying clothes, we'll just go over this a little bit to, so you can see. So in addition to his regular flying suit there and his boots, this guy has his armored vest or flak vest. And depending on where you were on the air crew, I mean, they would have different shapes and sizes that would fit into their position. But the entire thing like this for a gunner would weigh up to 20 pounds. So think of that in addition to your leather suit. If you can have one of these lighter, different textile cotton and wool jackets, it's going to make your whole life a lot easier considering you have your flak vest, you have helmets, you have your oxygen mask and everything else. So all important. We'll show you one thing just so we can walk around for a second. The other, one other piece of equipment that they were regularly wearing on top of all of this was their May West flight jacket, which we do have an example of here in the museum. Here we'll take a little stroll through our exhibit hall. So on top of all of their other clothing, when they were over water, they were often wearing their May West so that if they had to bail out, they could land in the water and this would inflate and keep them afloat, even if they had all that other gear on. So they really needed that, especially as they were flying over the English Channel where not only were the skies cold, but the water was very cold. They needed to be able to stay afloat till they could be rescued. So we'll go back over here. So just to kind of start wrapping things up, I mean, this clothing was important. Something that you'll notice a lot with these type of leather jackets and the A2s that was really popularized was um, actually they were first used by the uh, Flying Tigers in China. Now, they had something that some of you have probably heard of called a blood chit that was sewn into the back of their jackets. So that was something that if they were shot down, they could give that to locals and it had written in Chinese you know, please help support this airman, give them food, etc. The U.S. government will pay for you. So in addition to having those, aircrew started putting in silk maps of wherever they were so that they could figure out how to escape the country safely. So there's an example of one. Though this is for the Pacific and in a place where they might not have used one too much, you can see that silk is the perfect material. They can just stitch it into the back of their jackets. It's flexible. They can just fold it up and put it in a pocket. If it gets wet or anything else, the airmen can still use it once they're on the ground in an emergency situation. So all of this... <clears throat> Actually, I have one quote I want to share with you just to kind of wrap up the life that these guys were living here as they were flying, in this particular case, over Germany. So this came from a waste gunner named Sergeant Stanley Smith of the 390th Bomb Group, and this was during the Munster Raid on October 10th, 1943, which was a big and unfortunately disastrous raid for the Army Air Force, where they lost many air crews. But he said there were bandit targets all around the clock as we stood back to back. And we'll let you zoom in on this picture so you can see the environment that these guys were actually in as waste gunners. There they are, back to back. And he says, our feet slipping on the rolling clutter of spent cartridge shells. You can't see as well in this picture, but they all just ejected onto the floor here, so they're dodging those. And then he continues, the wind, the wind stream screamed a banshee wail over the constant roar of the engines as the sub-zero cold tore through the wide open waste windows freezing the breath in our oxygen masks and raising ugly frostbite welts on the tiniest bits of unprotected flesh. Like clumsy deep sea divers in some intricate underwater ballet, we constantly fouled each other's interphone lines, oxygen hoses, and heated suit cords, which were our lifelines. I think he accentuates there how much this life support truly was life support in the way of flying clothing, their oxygen masks, um, especially their electric heating to try to stay warm. They depended on all of that to be able to survive their missions, whether they encountered the enemy or not. So from that, we really understand, just looking at the clothing in a museum, you get an idea of how cold it must have been for them to have to wear something like a B3 jacket or these A3 trousers. 
big heavy things. Um, and then, of course, the logistical feat of clothing thousands of airmen, either with leather or even with better textiles. People had to be making those here stateside. So one of the big takeaways throughout World War II is these guys were always able to, as I see in a lot of memes and different videos on Facebook, is um, improvise, adapt, and overcome. They truly were doing this. Even though this is all they were given, they made it work, whether it was the best thing they had or not. And then when they had the chance, they would develop it further. So just to end kind of technological... We, we have a question. Will the video, video be posted online? Yes, it will be. So, so to answer that question, the video will be posted online. We're hoping to also upload this to YouTube when we're done. So on our social media pages, we will include these links. But we're almost done, so no worries. <laughs> um, so towards the end of the war, just to show how much the Americans did adapt, so we get back to the B-29 um, Super Fortress. Now this was the first bomber and really the first airplane in the world that was standardly built to be pressurized. So we talked about our airliners, they're big tubes that have their oxygen levels regulated so that you're comfortable inside as far as temperature and breathing. Well the B-29 Super Fortress truly was the first aircraft to do this successfully. All the cabin compartments, the crew compartments were pressurized. So these guys didn't have to dress as heavy, though of course if their planes were shot up, that could lead to disaster. Um, in one case, there's an individual, uh, one of the gunners, his uh, window port that he looks out of was actually blown out as they were over the enemy target. And fortunately, he had tied a rope around his leg, but he got sucked out of the aircraft and was dangling there at the side of the plane at 300 miles an hour, 30,000 miles up. So that's even higher than our B-17s and B-24s could fly. So quickly, his other crew members, it took four of them to pull him back inside. And just in that short time, he sustained bad enough frostbite that he had to have a couple fingers amputated. So that really stresses it. Even with the um, it improved advanced technology, such as the B-29, things could still go wrong for these guys flying in combat situations. When is the museum open and hours for right now? So, here we've recently decided due to COVID-19, we have um, shortened our hours. We are still open Fridays and Saturdays. Fridays from 11 to 4 and Saturdays from <clears throat> 10 to 5. So we're still trying to make it available and taking precautions so you can come and visit us safely. But hopefully as this passes us and we get into summer, we invite all of you out to enjoy our flight line tours as well as some of our extended tours. What about the silver plate crews and their, their clothing? So the silver plate crews, most likely they were dressed a lot lighter, especially where they weren't expecting opposition. They might have just been in their summer dress, whether that was shirts or just some lighter jackets, kind of like the A2. They wouldn't have needed anything bulky like this. Okay. And so, just to end, yeah, clothing is important. So the next time you get on an airliner and start complaining about how tight you are, just remember some of these guys hardly even had seats on these aircraft. They were sitting on their flak vests to add a little comfort on these eight-hour missions where they didn't even have a proper lavatory to relieve themselves. So we really are lucky <clears throat> to be in the era we are. On the, uh, <clears throat> the heated flight suits, did they have a quick release to unhook it, or did they just cut the wire, or...? So they just had a simple plug-in connection, so they could have easily, honestly, walked away from the station, and it probably would have disconnected. The main thing that had to have a quick release was their flak vests, if they had to bail out. Those did, however many armor panels they had, depending on their position. They would just have one quick release, so they'd all drop to the ground, throw on your parachute, and out you go. Okay. And with that, I just want to do one quick shout out. I have a friend, her name is Omira Baker Daniels. So Omira was actually on the Lockheed Vega um, assembly plant for B-17s. She was an expediter delivering supplies up and down to all the women as they put these bombers together to do their part in the war effort. So she just turned 98 yesterday. Unfortunately, she's pretty failing in health, but 
we just have to remember to be grateful for everyone who took part, whatever their role was, in helping um, the United States win World War II. So she's a special friend of mine, which is why I want to give her credit. If you have any well wishes, feel free to post those in the comments too, and we'll share this with her family. But there we are at the end, so we'll do a quick um, question and answer. If anyone has questions just about the base in general, about the topic today, and also if you have any topics... Let me just point, point out that those are all the used shells. He's... Yeah, right here are the used shells that Jim is mentioning. So you can see how much went into this. Um, so yeah, we'll post um, resources for the reading if you're interested about the topic or the Army Air Force. And is there anyone out there that does have questions or possible recommendations of future topics? We're getting silence on our end, so, so. <laughs> feel free to continue to comment if you're watching this after um, we go off. But again, we'll try to post this. We'll make sure it's known on social media, and we'll hope to see you next week with our new topic. Thanks for joining us.